time in coronavirus era. Um, I come from Italy. I'm a psychologist and psychotherapist, accredited EMDR Europe consultant and facilitator. Uh, in Italy, I'm co-director with the uh, Isabel Fernandez of Center of EMDR Therapy for Eating Disorder in Milan. And now we are opening a new EMDR therapy center for children. Um, I have done a postdoctoral program in clinical psychology, uh, and I'm senior researcher at Unitalian University of Lugano in Switzerland. Um, I follow specific training and obtain the reliability of a, of a series of measures aimed to evaluate the relational dynamic in adulthood and in childhood. For example, the adult attachment interview, Manchester the Child Story Task, Reflecting Functioning, and so on. My research topic mainly concerns the study of family relational dynamic and in particular mother-child interaction in the light of attachment theory. Um, I publish a different protocol in Luber's book about attachment, eating disorder, and also parenting. And so in Italy, I'm a teacher and lecturer of uh, ongoing courses about uh, EMDR and attachment issue, eating disorder, and also the working with complexity, complexity of defense uh, in EMDR therapy. So I'm really, really happy to be here with you today. Maria, thank you. Thank you so much, too, for inviting Kathy and Stephanie and I to help you present this wonderful presentation that you put together. It is full of so much um, just great information. I'm going to keep it short. I'm Deb Wesselman from Omaha, Nebraska in the U.S., where I practice with the Attachment Trauma Center of Nebraska, and I am part of the Attachment Trauma Center Institute, which is a training institute. And we are EMDR and attachment trauma focused. Hi, I'll go next. My name is Kathy Schweitzer and um, I'm also from Omaha, Nebraska here in the United States and um, practice with both Deb and Stephanie. And I'm also a part of the Attachment and Trauma Center Institute where we also do a variety of trainings and consultations. So we're excited to be here with you, Maria, and thank you for allowing us to help you present this wonderful piece of information. And I will, of course, keep it short too, because I work very closely with Deb and Kathy. Our offices are in the same hallway, <laughs> so we work right together. Um, but uh, my name is Stephanie Armstrong, and I am a part of the um, Attachment Trauma Center Institute, as well as practicing um, with children and families with the Integrative Attachment Trauma Protocol that we have created. Um, a couple things I just wanted to say right off. We had people registering for this just this morning, which is just extremely wonderful. Um, I was talking with Kathy and Deb yesterday, and I really want everyone to just sit for a minute and see what an amazing thing this is that all of us can come together virtually um, in a way that is beautiful like this. Even though we have the social distancing going on, we are all together right now learning. So I wanna thank Maria so much for creating this presentation. If you don't have your handouts yet, they will be coming. They should be in your inbox. So if you don't have them yet, check your inbox because they're probably there. And there are so many people on this. We will not be able to be in charge of the chat. So we won't, we won't be able to answer all of the questions coming in. Um, and like Deb has said, you will be getting the recording. So if something happens with your internet or you can't hear us, you will be getting this recording. Okay. okay. So I am going to go ahead and begin. So this is a global catastrophe that we are um, experiencing right now. We have forced quarantine all over the world. We have fears about a life-threatening illness that could strike us or our loved ones. 
Some of us have experienced the illness, some of us have family members who are ill, or even have lost family members. There is no balance for parents. There is no respite from parenting. They are parenting now 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There is no contact with their support networks. And many, many families are also suffering from economic problems due to job losses and um, companies shutting down. So naturally, many, many parents and individuals are suffering from mental health conditions or worsening of mental health conditions, such as panic conditions, anxiety, post-traumatic stress, or hypochondria, a focus on their bodies and the symptoms with, with all of the anxiety that we have about this illness. This is a perfect storm also that can erupt in domestic violence or child abuse. The, the forced quarantine and all of the anxieties and stressors bring all the difficult dynamics in families right to the forefront or creates difficult dynamics in families that weren't there before. And experts have even learned that child abuse and domestic abuse increase dramatically during times of natural disasters in any part of the world. And so of course, there has indeed been an increase in domestic abuse and child abuse around the world because of, of this disaster. One psychologist, Yo Jackson at Penn State, a researcher, is reporting that COVID-19 is directly responsible for an increase in child abuse due to the economic strains, the fewer resources and less respite for parents, the social isolation that parents are experiencing, the stress of the forced quarantine on partner relationships, and an escalation in children's behaviors because children are also stressed and anxious and worried about what is happening and suffering from the loss of friends and teachers in school and normal structure and perhaps worried about illness in their family or suffering death in their families. Also, we need to be aware that Child Protective Services may not be functioning at full capacity right now. So not all cases of child abuse are going to be detected and many will go without intervention. So our jobs as child therapists, parent therapists, family therapists, is critical right now to provide that support, to provide intervention, to prevent escalation of families' difficulties and stress into an abuse situation. So COVID-19 specifically involves many, many extra stressors. For example, parents are trying to work from home. They are supervising and managing children and keeping children entertained at the same time and even homeschooling children at the same time. Many parents are having to go to work. They're leaving children alone during the day. They're leaving older children in charge of younger children which is not always a good option, and parents are exhausted. I was listening, listening to the news the other night, and uh, a nurse was talking about treating COVID patients all day long from early in the morning until late at night, and then going home to her children who were needy and anxious, and she was exhausted and just wanting to sleep, and every day, and every day it was the same routine. Um, and she was also exhausted from having to watch her patients suffer and some, of course, were, were dying. 
but we also have parents who are working as grocery store clerks or cleaning grocery stores or stocking shelves and doing other types of work long into in long hours and uh, it, it, in many parts of the world we have parents who are leaving their children and losing their jobs eventually because their jobs are shutting down so parents are exhausted and stressed they don't have enough outlets they're missing their friends they're missing extended family they're missing their regular activities so we cannot underestimate the amount of stress and suffering that this is causing and we need to promptly intervene wherever we can we need to validate the fatigue the sadness the despair the overwhelm the feelings of inadequacy we want to normalize all of those feelings but not in a dismissive way we want to convey that we understand those feelings in a very compassionate way so in particular it is important to remember that in light of stressful ongoing conditions that parents are experiencing and the impact of difficult and or traumatic life events that are actually caused by this virus we are treating parents for both conditions the ongoing stress and and events that are traumatic that are either seen on their news on the news or experienced in their homes the good news is that therapy in general and EMDR therapy specifically can help parents and improve the family dynamics. So the overall result is emotion regulation and well being for our parents and families. EMDR therapy can help parents deal with present life stressors and have a more positive response to their children's needs. We can help them improve their responses to the present day traumatic events and to memories of past traumas that may be triggered due to these present events. EMDR therapy can reduce the reactivity and it can help parents improve the emotion regulation and increase the sensitive responses to their children's behaviors and emotions. Of course, EMDR therapy can also improve the parents' relationships with one another as well. I'm going to back up and just make sure. Okay. On the bottom of this slide, I have written, uh, I've placed two studies that show some indication that EMDR therapy can change attachment status in both adults and in children. Both of these articles are published in the Journal of EMDR Practice and Research. So a little bit of background now about EMDR therapy and the reason that we are looking at the attachment relationship in the adults as well as the children in the homes. Bowlby defines the attachment bond between the child and the caregiver as a long lasting, emotionally significant relationship for both members of the dyad. So children have an innate predisposition towards maybe being um, more regulated or being more dysregulated, but we now know that early experiences have a huge impact on 
the ability of children to manage their emotions, to trust others, and to manage stressful circumstances. John Bowlby tells us that children are biologically wired to attach to the figure who will protect them. So when children feel frightened, their attachment system is activated and they want to move toward their attachment figures for help. This is a protective mechanism that helps them survive. How the attachment figure responds determines how the child begins to trust himself, his attachment figures, and the world around him. And it has lifelong impact. John Bowlby called the internal belief system that the child develops as a result, the internal working model, the IWM. In EMDR terms, we talk about negative beliefs, long-term negative beliefs that affect the way we think about ourselves, the way we think about the world, and the way we think about others. So if caregivers respond with sensitivity to children's fears, children develop a more positive internal working model. This is consistent with Francine Shapiro's adaptive information processing model, which says that children who develop positive beliefs about self and others and the world store those beliefs in a neural network, in their neural networks, and these beliefs drive positive expectations, healthy responses to relationships, healthy regulation, self-regulation responses to stress. But children who've developed negative beliefs about self, others in the world, have stored unprocessed material that is triggered by present day stressors. And when that material is triggered, those memory networks open up and they are looking at the world through the lens of the negative self view, the negative view of others and the negative view of the world that they developed early in their lives. So EMDR therapy is a, a wonderful therapy to treat these early attachment traumas because we are linking new adaptive information to stored maladaptive information in the brain. So let's think for a minute about how trauma is transmitted from parents to children, especially in the time of the coronavirus. Children actively seek their parents' reassurance. When children are anxious, they're turning to their parents for help. If a parent carries unresolved trauma and carries a negative belief system stored in their neural networks, and children are approaching parents for reassurance, the parents are not able to provide the co-regulation that the children need. The result is that the children have negative beliefs that are further entrenched and their disorganized or non-secure attachment with their parents is, is further deepened. If children can go to parents and receive reassurance and re receive the caregiving that they need from sensitive caregivers, the attachment relationship is even further deepened. And an experience like this can actually lead to more closeness between parents and children. So what can we do to help with this? This is, this is the big question.
we do know, according to the adult attachment interview, that parents who have unresolved loss and unresolved trauma from childhood most likely have a disorganized attachment status. In other words, when their early traumas and losses are activated, they become disorganized and disoriented. And their children actually see little mini episodes of dissociation. When those unresolved traumatic memories surface, while the parents are responding to their children's attachment requests, the mental pain associated with those memories is activated in the parent's attachment system at the same time that the caregiving system is activated. As a result, children become disorganized in their patterns of attachment and are more likely to suffer anxiety, depression, and as they approach adolescence, they're more likely to suffer from depression and anxiety disorders and maybe dissociative disorders those children are at higher risk of further traumatization and PTSD symptoms from the coronavirus era. We now know that transmission of poor attachments and trauma also takes place biologically through the DNA. The field of epigenetics has uncovered some really interesting information. This top study shows how, show, is a study in which the RNA from the sperm of traumatized mice, adult male mice, was implanted in the impregnated female females and the the mice that were born to the females showed symptoms of traumatization simply through the transmission of the RNA so this is um, quite an astounding type of research and phenomenon and, and has made us all think about the neurobiological implications of trauma. The good news is EMDR therapy also has an impact on the neurobiology in the same way when we look at the brain and the changes in the brain, we see that EMDR therapy has a positive impact on the neurobiology. So we have to wonder, does that mitigate some of the transmission of trauma and attachment trauma through the RNA when we apply the EMDR therapy. Something to think about and much more, much more research clearly is needed. So in this workshop, we're going to focus on all of the difficulties that parents have to face in this moment to preserve and take care of the caregiving system. And the workshop will focus on helping parents through the following types of 
modalities, psychoeducation, resourcing, reprocessing of traumatic events, working with parts of self, and of course, EMDR therapy. So the first part of this webinar will be focused on psychoeducation for the parents. How to help parents understand why COVID-19 has created this dysregulation for themselves and for their children and how it impacts their relationships with their children. It will help parents recognize the emotions and the behaviors in themselves and in their children and what their children need. The second part of this program is focused on resourcing for parents, providing resources to parents that will help them survive and stay regulated and transmit a more secure pattern of attachment to their own children and using EMDR as a type of resourcing to strengthen parents' positive affect and self-regulation in times of crisis and times of stress within their families. We will also focus on the reprocessing of the traumatic events. So guidelines will be provided to therapists regarding the conceptualization and treatment planning with parents, including in the plan, EMDR therapy on big T traumas linked to the pandemic, triggering events that elicit the onset of the distress, memories reported by the patient in the history taking phase, the float back to trace back all the episodes connected with the triggering event, as well as transgenerational traumas. So for example, serious illness that, that was experienced or a grandfather in the past that experienced trauma in the war. And Finally, the presentation will focus on working with parents' parts of self, helping parents understand their own parts of self and how they are activated during the COVID-19, and guidelines for using the dissociative table in the meeting place to provide and prepare parents for work with the coronavirus trauma and work-specific to parenting. This section will provide tools to identify the patient's protective parts and child parts and strategies to help the parents reinforce the defensive parts to better cope and also help with caring for those vulnerable child parts during those critical moments during this, this pandemic. So, I am going to turn the screen share over to Stephanie and Kathy, I hope. And I am not sure. Uh, Kathy, are you able to take the, ah, if I stop, I can now yeah. stop sharing. Yeah, you stop there sharing. we go. There we go. And then I will, I will hopefully be able to share screen share. And I will get off and I'll be on a little bit later. Thanks, Deb. Let me just kind of figure out here. There we go. There we okay. Can. So again, I'm Stephanie Armstrong. And I'm Kathy Schweitzer. And we're going to take you through this next phase of the presentation. Yes. Um, this is the psychoeducation phase. Um, and so we will begin talking about all of the things that you might be able to do to prepare parents through the psychoeducation piece. 
And go ahead, Kathy. I was gonna say, I think I'm first. Okay, so as we move into this, into this piece, we're reminded that fear is a primary emotion. And of course, it's fundamental for our defense in our survival systems, right? So this, this concept has been around since the beginning of time. And if we don't feel fear, we're not able really to save ourselves from risk. So it's actually a very, it's actually a very important emotion. And a limited dose of fear and alertness is necessary in order to be activated without losing lucidity. So the problem, the possibility to following the indications of the authorities requires a minimum of activation. activation. There's lots of words in here. I have to get my tongue moving this morning. So what you're looking at is the limit between functional activation, which creates positive stress and is necessary as compared to an excess of alert with dysfunctional behaviors, where that means the stress or the distress is larger or is negative stress and it can be subtle. So what this is really talking about is helping, under, helping parents understand that fear is a normal emotion at a certain level and then it can become dysfunctional. And so as we are parenting through this pandemic, all of us, um, clinicians, parents, and children are being activated in dealing with these emotions all the time. And so when you think about what, what parents have been exposed to and their children, right, is the supermarkets or the grocery stores um, um, became radically, you know, crowded and um, people were stocking up on food supplies and toilet paper, and it has led right to, I'm sure we've all seen in the news, concentration of people in close spaces, and people are fighting and, and hurting one another because they've moved into that dysfunctional state. The fear has overwhelmed their system, and then this is what happens. So we become disorganized and we fear getting sick. So, so what you're saying, Kathy, is really teaching parents the difference between functional activation and dysfunctional behaviors that can actually cause and lead to more stress. That's absolutely correct. I think during this portion of the presentation, what we're really helping people to try to figure out is kind of normalizing some of these responses that we don't typically experience in our day-to-day -day lives. So helping parents gain a deeper insight into this and have some tools to help them through it. Right, and like Deb said before, not dismiss, but help normalize. Right. And really helping parents name what's going on within them. Sure. And I think when, when a parent can understand what's happening inside of them, um, they're able then to better attune to themselves and then therefore co-regulate with their child. So that's really what this part of the presentation is about. And the next piece is how anxious, system, anxious symptoms, fear, can then turn into panic. And where there is this perceived, um, everything is risky. Every situation I go into could be risky. So if I stop and I have to get gas, well, that could be risky. But then fear can also then take on this form of hypochondria. And Deb did talk about this a tiny bit already. This tendency for excessive concern for one's health by perceiving every minimal symptom as an example of the coronavirus infection. And I remember when this started to come to the United States, um, I was, I had a cough, a little cough, and I didn't want to cough in front of other people because I was afraid of how they might perceive me. Mm -hmm. And then I went and got a thermometer and I was taking my temperature. So I think all of us can, can relate to this in one way or another because 
fear creates us to do certain things to try to protect ourselves. Exactly. Um, well stated, Scott. And you know, this, the coronavirus is like an invisible enemy. Um, I think uh, this, this credit goes to Maria in, in, in calling it an invisible enemy because, we, yeah, we can't see it. Uh, we can't feel it. We can't see it coming. And so we've got, we've fluctuated, right, from underestimation of risk versus panic. So as you said earlier, Steph, when this started back in January in China, I remember thinking, well, my life is still my life. And I was certainly concerned and cognizant and um, started watching the news more frequently. But I kind of thought, well, it's really far away from me, which in fact it actually was. Um, and then of course, as the virus spread, you know, then it went to Italy. And when Italy was really hit, um, I think that got more of my attention, like, oh my goodness. And so what has happened is we're shifting from this underestimation of risk to now panic. So now it's here. Now it's in my community, right? My daughter works at a hospital and is a pharmacist. So it has crept closer to me. And what happens is I do not act in self-protection and community protection behaviors all the way to now, I constantly feel the threat of this invisible enemy that can infect me and my loved ones at, at any moment. So as we're talking with parents, understanding and recognizing that this is, I think, very true, what I just explained for at least all of us um, in the United States as it, it has come here later. And I have seen an uptick in the, the parents that I am working with and families that I am working with where, oh, I remember, you know, this is no big deal. It's going to be a China thing. Gosh, that's really bad too. Okay, holy smokes, it's in my backyard. And I would say that, um, Kathy, some parents have felt guilty for the initial underestimation. Absolutely. And it is important to help them. And I love the, the way Maria did this because the truth is we have to help them um, reduce the amount of shame that they may have for the underestimation that they, may, they did early on because that was a normal thing. Mm -hmm. for us to do. Right. So again, more about this invisible enemy. So the thought process that can take place um, for all of us, but as you're working with parents, they might be asking, why is this happening? Why does it spread so fast? And then whose fault is it? So trying to gain control, because there is a sense of helplessness directly related to this. But then what the system, what our system tries to do is gain control by identifying the culprit, deciding who and how to punish, which leads to anger and judgment towards this plague spreader. So then it can lead to this compulsive searching on the web for information and all of these alternative theories that indicate this culprit. However, the truth about it is, is psychoeducation can then help lead to adaptive behaviors to help regain a sense of healthy control in a very constructive way. And I love the way Maria said this, dealing with coronavirus versus worrying about coronavirus and helping parents balance those two because there there does need to be a balance between the two and it's normal to have the worry and then how can we help shift over to dealing with it mm -hmm. um, i think that's a really important point as i as i was preparing to do this presentation of course i was reflecting on my own behaviors as a parent and as a therapist and as a spouse and I remember reading intensely about it all the time and trying to get, I don't know, I guess ahead of it in my own mind. And then what I began to realize is that um, this is just happening and I don't have control. And so I was able to kind of release myself from, okay, I don't, I don't have to have this all figured out. And it, 
it really doesn't matter anymore how it started. And, and so kept, parents to, oh, sorry, to conceptualize that, like attuning to that, like I have several parents who are like, you know, we need to get to the bottom of this as a country and this and that, and just attuning to them saying, yeah, right. We try to make sense of the nonsensical. And so what about if we just dealt with it instead of worrying about it or placing blame or detective work? And I, I think a, a healthy um, sense of self-disclosure is important when we're working with parents because we are all in this together. Mm -hmm. I've never experienced this before. And so a, a, a healthy sense of self-disclosure is important because I remember having to make a drive um, back to my hometown when all of this started and literally from the time I got in the car to the time five hours, I was listening to the news almost the whole time. Not good for me, <laughs> but I was in that stage. And so I have shared that with parents so they, they can understand that it is normal. It's a normal part of this process. It is important to, to educate parents on post-traumatic stress signals. Have you skipped a slide? Did I? I'm sorry. Yeah. So what I was going to talk about, I don't know. Now I don't know if this is my slide or your slide. Um, this is your it. slide. This is your slide. Okay. We practice yesterday. Um, so what also is starting to occur is this sense of survival guilt that we all know about and has been around that, that term. Um, has been around a long time and of course this sense of abandonment so guilt for having sur survived or for not even having suffered any type of physical damage so for example feeling guilty about the people who have had positive cases of coronavirus and feeling guilty when meeting people who have lost a family member through coronavirus so really again it's about listening and compassion with these parents and allowing them to explore all these different emotions, but helping to try to hold them in this secure holding environment and acknowledging, yeah, those things are true, right? That you haven't been positive, but this person hasn't been positive and helping them get, navigate through those emotions so that they can become more regulated and more healthy and continue to parent and work. Okay. Now it's so, your turn. Yes, now it's my turn. So educating them about post-traumatic stress signals. Um, just these survival reactions and defense mechanisms, uh, defense systems that we all um, are very aware of, right? The, the fight, the flight, the freeze, and then the faint, the hypotonic immobility with loss of control over movement. So again, it's all about educating them about these signals so they have an awareness. So when you think about the factors and the upsetting thoughts influencing emotional response, of course your brain goes right back to that, the AIP model about thoughts and feelings and behaviors and negative cognitions and positive cognitions. And when you think about it kind of in these three ways, so there's a sense of responsibility for what has happened. So you might have a parent who's got this thought about infecting someone. I've infected my brother-in-law, so now I'm a bad person. So what we're seeing is an emerging group of parents um, and adults um, who are starting to take on some of those really upsetting thoughts and emotional responses. So then the next one would be really that sense of vulnerability and that lack of security. So at home, I even don't feel safe. People who are bringing me shopping bags may have touched products or their products may have the virus on them. So again, these emerging things that, that as EMDR therapists, we're not, you know, this has taken on a category of its own, right? So this hyper arousal around not being safe and being vulnerable from a grocery store item to being in contact with someone who really has it. And then of course, problems related to control and self-efficacy. All of this is useless, I'm helpless, and then you get all the way to, I can't handle it. 
And then there is this other piece where there's this cumulative exposure to traumatic events. And if we look at it just in regards to the coronavirus, there is this cumulative exposure to this and the neural networks remain in this activated state. So um, if you can just for yourself right now, think about how when it first started, right, that that was kind of like a little T trauma and then it, another one and another one, and it's just little T mounted onto little T. And so then what happens is this layering, um, this layering of trauma that happens. And then we remain in this activated state. So then there's this risk of developing PTSD and co comorbidity with other disorders, which then increase in relation to the number of exposures and events and experiences. So it's like, um, it's like a domino effect, essentially. It's like, it's like, well, this and then this, and then it all just you know, falls apart. Um, we can't get out of it because of the constant presence right now of, of the COVID. Um, and so if you just think about even the small, I, you know, they're not really small, but they seem small, of going to the grocery store and seeing people with masks on, that can lead to maybe not a sense of security, that can lead to maybe some fear and helping educate parents that, you know, turning that around and helping them understand that there is a sense of those people are taking responsibility, wearing their masks. I just think, as I reflect on that slide, it, it's an unusual circumstance where we actually can't, we can't get out of it. And I think that's what's so important. Like it's present every single day. So you're going to see people with these types of post-traumatic stress signals increasing. So you're going to see people who are reporting that they're having even more difficulty sleeping or more difficulty concentrating or memory difficulties. You're going to maybe see an increase of addictive behaviors, fatigue and lack of energy and irritability and restlessness and isolation because we're fighting against something that we can't get out. So our systems continue to remain activated. Um, I was doing a consult uh, the other day with um, a, a good friend who is a therapist in Washington, D.C., and we were kind of comparing notes about doing telehealth and dealing with, you know, our families. And she said, I'm having such a hard time remembering from week to week what I did in session. And I just thought to myself, oh, my gosh, that's how I feel. So back in the day before the virus was here, um, not that I had a perfect memory, but I was able to carry information from session to session. And during these weeks where we're all social distancing and doing teletherapy, I am startled by my own lack of being able to remember. And I think it just goes to show that my system is in an activated state as well. So what I've done as a therapist is I have a pad of paper and pen and I just write notes excessively as I'm talking. But I just think it's interesting that it touches all of us and helping parents to understand the reason you're excessively tired you're already tired as a parent and the excessive tiredness is because of your hyper aroused state. So again, normalizing and then helping them to figure out ways to feel better. That's right. And then you know, the most common reactions to coronavirus can last for a few days or even a few weeks. And I think it actually, the, the few weeks is, is probably more applicable. Um, and educating parents about intrusiveness, these reoccurring images that, that probably take place, um, this involuntary and intrusive memories of the event. So flashbacks related. Um, they can manifest as short episodes or complete loss of consciousness. There is also the avoidance where maybe we're avoiding this idea of going to get checked to see if we have the coronavirus. I'm not going to call the doctor. So there is the intrusiveness of maybe a memory like Maria has listed here, um, or this idea of avoiding it 
completely. And sometimes we, we think that, um, that PTSD symptoms can only um, occur in these big, you know, events such as maybe a, a car accident or a fire and educating parents that this is this is this is causing PTSD mm -hmm. and it is something that we can be gentle and we can we can be aware of in our own systems. So, I think we've kind of I, I think we've touched on this a little bit, but hyperarousal. So what we've noticed is the increase in psychophysiological activation. So when, when talking with your parents um, and they're explaining different types of things or different symptoms, you know, our bodies react just as much as our brains do. And so they'll have maybe increased respiration while watching the news or in a regular heartbeat or tachycardia to the news of the first positive case in their own city or town or village. And then an increase in taking one's own temperature and just this, oh, do I feel warm? Um, I have a daughter who is home from college and um, she kind of moves in and out of these symptoms as well. Um, so her system is hyper aroused and I will find her um, taking her temperature and I will just ask her Hannah what is your temperature today and she'll say well I think this thermometer is broke and I'll say well what's your temperature and it will be 98.6 and I'll say actually I think that really is what your temperature is but in parenting her I'm attuning to her because that is her hyper aroused state and so um, addressing and helping parents attune not only to themselves or to their spouses or to their children. And then of course, what starts to happen is we see this depressed mood kind of appear and become more pervasive. And then of course, attached to that depressed mood are those persistent negative thoughts um, and beliefs or the expectations about ourselves in the world. So feeling really a deep sense of abandonment and negative thoughts such as, and I know I've had this, I've had this thought myself, like this is never gonna change. Um, or the world is a dangerous place, or we are doomed. So as Deb was reflecting in the first part of this presentation, addressing some of those NCs that have evolved that are becoming interfering, um, this is just a sample of maybe some of those things or some of those thoughts that parents may be carrying. And then teaching parents about the stages of trauma resolution, because um, it will resolve with help. Um, however, if you look at the, start with the last one, if we start with the last one first right now, we will have to learn to live with a new reality. There is going to be a new reality. And I think that that is, that is a piece to connect with parents as we help teach them that there, there will be stages to this. So there is the emotional impact that, that can happen right away, right? The nightmares and isolation and depression, guilt, anxiety, increased, um, increased alcohol use or, or drug use, um, this increased feeling of danger. But then it processes into coping we're understanding and where we're processing. And the, the, the last half of this presentation, uh, Maria will talk a lot about the coping piece and helping parents through this. And what, what would have happened if, or why me and next time? But then there is this acceptance and this resolution. So that's all behind me now. And this is our new reality. I'm vulnerable, but I'm not helpless. I can't control everything, but I can control my emotional response. And I think that that's, that's a very important thing mm -hmm. to continue to connect with parents because that's true. We can't control everything. So um, there is this, this idea that there are people out there who are reckless. They are not following the guidelines that is the reality and we can't control everything, but I can control my emotional response and I can control how 
I am going to instruct my family and how I am going to go to the store or do all of those things. And then, of course, I did talk about then learning to live with the new reality. It is kind of difficult, though, at this point to get my brain to that last one. Um, but to know that there is a state, these stages of trauma resolution is vital. So really, it's important to help parents understand that all the emotional states experience, the ones that they're experiencing, even if they're very uncomfortable emotions, are really completely normal. Uh, parents must be validated regarding the fatigue associated, how hard it is to parent during this time and the negative emotions related to the relationships with their children. And I really find myself really talking a lot with the parents that I serve and the families that I serve that, yeah, it, it feels out of control and it is out of control, but here's what you can do. And it's okay to feel that way and then helping them shift and to develop some coping standards or do some reprocessing of their own to help them at least tolerate as we continue to move through this this unusual time in our, in our world. So kind of moving on now to educating parents more about their children's emotional um, needs, their children's emotions and needs. And um, as I, as I start this slide, I am looking out back and my three boys are essentially doing some crazy things out there. <laughs> and I was like, this slide is great for me as, as I, I think that they might be wrestling and fighting with sticks and all of these crazy things. And it's fine, right? <laughs> but children, they're, they're going to suffer emotionally due to this coronavirus. There's so many layers to it. But they, they do not often recognize or verbalize their feelings. And this goes all the way up to adolescence. Even Kathy mentioned her daughter, who is a young adult. There is, it is, even for us sometimes, it is hard for us to recognize or verbalize our feelings. But for children, fear and anxiety manifests in behaviors. And this is critical that parents understand this. So there, there could be a fear of separating from the parent, for example, at bedtime, or if the parent is going to go to the store. Anything that's a little different, clingy behaviors, whining, tearfulness. My eight-year-old has wanted to sit with me out here as I've been working. He normally doesn't want to do that. Um, meltdowns over small things um, that the children may not normally melt down about, they're going to, and, and it's, it's typical. So anger episodes or a moment of, of just kind of atypical quiet, that's something to, to be aware of. And then just physical symptoms such as stomach aches or headaches or um, even just uh, restlessness in their bodies is definitely something to keep track of. And helping parents attune to the somatic, to the somatic symptoms or the behaviors because what's driving that are these emotions. Exactly. I, I don't know about you, Stephanie, but my inbox has been flooded with questions from parents about why their kids are, are doing these unusual things. And really, that's the answer. And I, mm -hmm. it, it makes me sad. Sometimes, like, everybody is experiencing such distress and saying, you know, like, yes, that, that, was, an, that was an odd behavior. Um, one of mm -hmm. my clients ate a stick of butter. Um, which I don't think is a typical behavior of hers. And just allowing the parents to say, yeah, I don't know what really why she ate a stick of butter, but what it's telling me is that she's extremely stressed and it's manifesting in this way. And so what I've begun to do is have a few extra sessions with parents alone without their child present um, via telehealth to help do all of these things, to help ground these parents back into it's going to be okay and your kids are gonna do some strange stuff. So 
in order to continue to help with this process, what we help parents and we tell parents is we need to help increase the child's felt safety. In a time when things feel unsafe, whatever we can do to help them feel safer. So children need really clear and accurate information. Of course, it has to be appropriate to their developmental stage. Um, and it is, of course, important to limit children's exposure to images and news not suitable for the level of understanding. And I think that's a real challenge um, in the world today that we are inundated with all types of social media. When I was a child, you know, you had to turn on the news at six o'clock and that was really the only exposure. So if my parents didn't want me to see something, the TV just was off or I was sent out of the room. You know, but kids who are as young as seven um, who have phones or access to social media or whatnot, they're exposed to images um, that are very, very scary. And so really helping to try to mitigate some of that and then to provide them accurate information. And so one way to do that, which we have explained to our parents is, you know what, if, if your child is, is super inquisitive and wants to know, then maybe make a time to watch a news a portion of the news or read an article together. And then you can help as you're sitting there with them, reassure that child about what they're really saying. And what you're going to do is not, not make it not true. Like it's never good, I think, to tell kids to not worry, or this isn't gonna be a big deal, or it isn't gonna happen to you, because I think they're smart enough and their bodies and brains are sensing that that's not true. And so to help them understand, these are the things that mom and dad are doing to keep you safe, and that there are all kinds of people in the world, literally, uh, I don't know how many, that are working around the clock to try to figure out how to develop a, a vaccine or different strategies or different ways to handle different situations. So it is really important to highlight those aspects as well when they hear something from a television show or they've read something or they've seen some sort of post or of course the internet. I think it is important the the developmental um, ability of the child. And I think there might be some children um, developmentally who being exposed to the news is not appropriate. Right. However, their, um, their developmental um, upset you know, in their phase could be that they can't do the things that they might normally do, like maybe go play with friends at a park or um, you know, go with mom to the grocery store or those things. So it, it really is the developmental stage and what to attune to that the child needs attunement because older kids, right, are gonna understand this at a different, at a different level. Right. So providing safety um, to children, more about that, but kids must continue to do kids stuff like wrestle in the backyard with sticks. <laughs> <laughs> um, talking about fun things, um, doing homework, learning new things. I, you know, what's kind of been fun is um, just kind of, to be honest, is doing homework with my kids. I, I'm like, wow, to my 15 year old, you're really learning some really hard math. <laughs> um, so, so that is kind of been nice to be in their world more than what I had been before. Um, but also helping provide safety by knowing that they do need more time with the parent or the other attachment figures. Um, they might want more time with the parent and, and they, they do like being aware of our facial expressions and what's going on with our system is important. Remembering that children are good observers but their interpretation of what's going on is typically very poor. And we do share that with parents quite often mm -hmm. because parents will be confused as to why a child thinks a certain way. And we tell them, well, we have to make sure they know the truth. They, they've observed that situation, but they have not interpreted it correctly. And then that co-regulation, so again, my nervous system in a more regulated 
place is going to automatically regulate my child's nervous system if I'm more regulated. And children might notice adult inconsistencies. In fact, they, they will. <laughs> it says might, but I have, they will. Yeah. Um, you know, things like with a parent, and I, Kathy talked about this a little bit ago, but you don't have to be afraid. But then, you know, we have, uh, I don't, but you know, then, then they're, they're buying all of this canned food that could last for, you know, a year. Well, that generates confusion because it doesn't seem like those match. So making sure parents attune and acknowledge to the fear and then explain, well, sweetie, the reason I bought all these green beans is because, okay, or the reason that mom bought, you know, two or three packs of toilet paper is because, okay, so just really making sure that they understand the truth. And then helping parents access their own support system from other family members, community, friends, and of course, professional help outside of maybe you as the therapist working with the child. So a little bit more about this safety. So as I'm sure you guys all over the world have noticed that, you know, parents are, are truly struggling at many different levels, some certainly more than other dependent on, you know, on their own past, which is, I think, what Maria is going to be sharing kind of in this next phase. But what I've seen is that because everybody is exhausted and tired, that they tend to kind of regress back into some more punitive types of, of consequences. And um, a punitive approach really decreases a child's sense of safety and increases anxiety. So, if you yell at them because they're asking you 9,490 million questions all day long, that is, that is exhausting as a parent. So what we're telling parents is that means your child is anxious. And then if they do something or they break something or they're not, and you're at your wit's end, you have to be mindful of that. And so saying, you know, why don't we all just take some space or why don't we all just take a break rather than reacting from that very um, hyper emotional state and being angry and just saying, Oh my God, go to your room. You know, you, you can't have your phone for a week. And I've talked to parents like, okay, so let's think about everybody being stuck at home and you've removed your um, 12 year old's phone. So what is that child going to do? for the next week. So really thinking through some of those consequences and, and, and it, won't, it won't help. Um, and Steph, I think you've referred to this several times about children needing to feel um, proximity with their parents or another caregiver, is obviously during these difficult times. So encouraging some intentional time with, with your child and spending, very connected, like non-directive interaction. So playing a game, but just playing the game for the game's sake, um, or just having fun. We had a big snowstorm here the other day, and Stephanie um, posted some pictures of herself playing with her boys um, out in the snowstorm, and just it's, it's just fun. We're just going to go outside, and we're just going to goof off, and we're going to hang out, in this crazy April snowstorm. Like we don't have to build a snowman or we don't have to do this. We're just gonna be connected. And really, as we, ref as we move past this and we're gonna look back at this, there's going to be some really great stories that come out of, out of this, this time, but there's also going to be some interesting and hopefully some positive memories along the way where we were able to spend more dedicated and connected time. And then Steph, again, I think too, you've talked about children are watching and listening and interpreting things all the time. And they misinterpret things all the time. Um, I have several kids on my caseload right now that are going to like that 
10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and they eavesdrop. They're listening. They're listening all the time. And they hear bits and pieces and different parts of stories or different parts of conversations. And they're watching their, their mom and dad interact and noticing their mom and dad's struggles emotionally, you know, to be trapped with one another all the time. And so if we try to hide those things, it's not going to work because they're listening and watching. So what we're encouraging parents to do is you really do have to take some space for yourself in order to take care of your children. If you're not okay, then your kids are not going to be okay. Mm -hmm. And you have to really do, um, you try to do a really good job of saying, okay, mom is, I'm super tired. I'm very, very tired and I'm not mad and I'm not angry, I'm just really tired. And you know what, I'm gonna go lay down and that's just all that is, and it's okay. Um, and then like you said, really trying to continue to access people that you can talk to, family members that you can text or Zoom. And then I, ha I had somebody reach out to me saying, I know that it's the a pandemic so I don't know if you're still doing therapy. And that really struck me because this person is really struggling. I'm like, of course, mm -hmm. uh, of course I'm still doing therapy. So if, if parents have not engaged in their own therapy yet, it really is okay to say, you know what? I know this is wacky and weird, but maybe, yeah, we'll find you a therapist and you can do some telehealth. Um, just like I'm doing with your family and get, get some assistance and maybe do some EMDR. So it's really okay even to reach out during this super weird time to get some of your own individual help. That's right. That's right. It's funny, Kathy, that you brought up the, the snowstorm because I had worked um, all day and I was so tired yeah. And I did not want to go after it was about five, five thirty when we went out to play and I had to force myself to do it. And I remember standing at the top of the hill, just thinking to myself, I'm so glad I chose to do this because I feel better now. Yeah. And, and I think that it's, it's important with, with parents to help them notice their sensations in their body, notice their feelings, and then have them notice what happens after maybe they do like that opposite action, right? I did opposite action purposefully. <laughs> well, you should worked. tell that you had forced yourself. Because yeah. Was, those were fun pictures. To see. <laughs> so more about what can I tell my child or my children. So really just explaining to them, and I think we did talk about this already some, um, in explaining it in an understandable manner according to their developmental age. Because if they don't know the truth, this is important, they will make it up. They will make up something terrible and they will blame themselves. So making sure they know the facts or the truth about what is what is happening. They do need this felt safety and to know that adults um, are around helping to prevent to pr protect this, prevent this illness. There's thousands of people working. I'm afraid sometimes I'm like, they probably need some sleep. <laughs> I think to that to myself, maybe they, hopefully they're getting enough sleep and food. Um, Cause they're working hard to prevent this illness, to come up with, um, strategies so it's important to reassure that you're safe in your home and there are people out there working hard um that it, but also every feeling you and your child all of us every feeling we're feeling and experiencing is normal when we normalize our feelings then we can normalize our child's feelings and then we're helping to heal the child and it's important to understand that some of the symptoms of the child, again, that we've talked about this, are probably a direct result of the feelings that they just can't put into words. So if you're working with kids and families who have experienced a traumatic past, um, basically everything that we have just talked about is true times 100. So if you are working with kids who have been abused or neglected or orphanage care 
or you're working with kids who are in residential treatment, or you're working with um, kids who are in foster care, all of these symptoms and behaviors may be even more exacerbated and providing psychoeducation to foster parents and to residential treatment staff um, is, is kind of a big deal. This, this slide in and of itself could be its own presentation. Mm -hmm. So yes. this is very, very brief, um, but I'm sure you all well know that if you are working with families who've got trauma, we have an extremely vulnerable population and the, the anxiety is sometimes, not sometimes, is even more significant than what it would be in a home where there is not significant trauma. So I know that that's a lot of work that Stephanie and Deb and I do. We, we work primarily with kids who have got trauma in their past. And so what we're seeing is more extreme behaviors and feelings of danger related to the coronavirus may trigger past feelings of danger that complicate their present day stress. So navigating just the stress of the coronavirus on top of all the work that you were doing with these families and these parents before this even started. Yes. So it, it's like, I, I think sometimes, Stephanie, you call it super duper parenting, <laughs> um, where we're really going to have to hold those parents and help them remain in that super duper parenting stage as much as they can if they're dealing with children that have been traumatized. Yes. So children with a traumatic past who no longer live with their biological family also may have difficulty trusting adults to care for them. I know on my caseload, I have several kids who are in foster care and this has been a very unique challenge. And so just keep in mind that this whole presentation would be like times a thousand if you were working with traumatized families. Mm -hmm. So I think what we're going to do now, Steph, is we're going to shift off, off, and I think Deb is going to have. Uh, oh my gosh, I can't talk anymore. Deb's going to come back on, but it was a pleasure yep. being with you guys here today. So I stopped sharing, and Deb is there. She is. Yes. Awesome. Now I will have to. Um, I'm going to bring up my slideshow, but I have to scroll down to the proper slide. So if everybody will be patient with me, okay. uh, I do that. All right. Oh, I went way too fast. <laughs> um, it's okay. Yeah. Keep going. Can you, okay. You, yeah. Right. Keep going. Okay. Yep. You got it. You're going to where it says parent resources. Yes. Keep there's going. A, there's a really cute um, picture. I should have a copy of, of the paper and I don't. Sorry, everyone. It's okay. All right. Okay. There, there we go. This is a cute picture. So now we're going to tell, talk about how to resource our parents so that they have more of what they need to be able to co-regulate their children and respond to their children's needs and take care of themselves. So uh, the first two slides are just a couple of really nice breathing exercises. And what I like to do is say to parents, look, your, your body is revved up, your central nervous system is on high speed right now or, or ever since the virus started. And for you to be able to regulate your child's central nervous system through co-regulation, you have to have a co-regulate, you have to have a regulated nervous system. And so if if I can help you with finding a method that works for you, then you can go to your child and not only be more regulated when you comfort your child or respond to your child's big behaviors, but you also 
could teach this to your child. Oftentimes, I'm actually working with parents and children together, and I'm teaching them self-regulation methods together. And I have a lot of families who go home at night and they practice various self-regulation exercises together as a family. So this is a, a very simple breathing exercise where the exhale is twice as long as the inhale. And then you gradually move toward longer inhales, longer inhalations, and longer exhalations. So you can begin with perhaps a count of one. So inhale one, and then exhale to the count of two. One, two. And then inhale to the count of two. And then exhale double to the count of four. One, two, three, four. Inhale to the count of three. And exhale to the count of six. And so on, you got the idea. And once the parent reports, just doing that right now felt really nice. And so once the parent reports that their nervous system, they can tell that it's slowed down, their breathing is, of course, slowed down, their heart has slowed down, they're feeling more grounded, they're feeling more um, centered or regulated, then you can ask them also to notice where they feel a pleasant sensation in their body. So having done that little bit with you just now, um, I would say that I notice a pleasant kind of a calm, fuzzy, light sensation in my chest. And then I would say to the parent, and you can do this easily over Zoom, let's just together do a little self-tapping. And I would do about eight to 10 reps as they notice where they feel the calm in their bodies. And often I like to talk as they're doing it to continue just sort of reinforcing and notice, you know, if your legs feel heavy and notice if your, um, your arms and legs feel calm and relaxed. And then they can stop and pay attention and you can repeat two or three times. And if you like, you can also ask them to come up with a cue word that would represent this very relaxed, calm feeling that they have in their bodies right now. So they might choose, you know, light or peace or calm or heavy. And you can do it one more time with the cue word in mind and noticing the very calm sensations and a little more of a self-tapping. And I tell people, even if you are, let's say you are at a meeting with your boss and you're meeting over Zoom, you can, and your boss is making you nervous, you can actually practice the breathing exercise during the meeting and do a little self-tapping on your knees and no one will be the wiser. At home with their children, I encourage parents, if the children are starting to have big behaviors or you're seeing anxiety, you're seeing big reactivity, have the child come and sit with you and do some breathing together. It's a really nice way to connect and to self-regulate and to co-regulate. And really, it's all about co-regulation with our kids. Even parents who tend to be disorganized and disoriented and they get triggered and um, they are easily stressed, even in those circumstances, they can learn these self-regulation methods, they can practice with their children, 
And together, parents and children can move toward greater self-regulation. And at the same time, they are strengthening their attachment relationship. They are becoming more connected, more attuned. They're experiencing shared pleasure, shared calm, as they feel the comfort and the connection being together and practicing the exercise. They're moving a little bit, just a little smidgen, maybe down the continuum towards greater attachment security. And as Kathy and Stephanie said, and I'm sure this is true for Maria too, a lot of the families that we work with are families that have a lot of trauma in the past. Parents have carried trauma, and then the children have trauma. Some of the children are foster children or adopted children with a traumatic history, or they have a traumatic history within the biological family because the parents early on were drug users or um, addicted to alcohol. So we have families who have all of this carried trauma that we've already been trying to to process and work through and help these families connect and find, um, find safety and self-regulation and co-regulation together. And now on top of that, we have a, a virus, an epidemic, and um, this is of course triggering all of the past carried trauma for both the parents and the children. So this kind of thing is so, so important to, um, to do, and even with the, the parents and the children together over, over Zoom or whatever um, method you use to do your, your telehealth. Another type of exercise, a breathing exercise, is the square breathing exercise. So in this one, you ask parents and children to imagine a square, and and so the breath the inhale is the same length as the pause at the end of the inhale and then the same length as the exhale and then that's the same length also as the pause at the end of the exhale so you can breathe with them together and you can use um, a count of two or three and start with you know one one two and then hold for two and exhale for two and then wait for two and you can do this with them together and you can gradually lengthen the inhale the pause the inhale the pause so count of two and then count of three three and then count of four and once the parent and if the child is there, the parent and child report that they are calm and they are relaxed. Then you can ask everybody who is with you, maybe it's the whole family sitting in the room. Um, and as you're working with them via Zoom, the whole family can notice the calm where they feel the calm in their bodies. And they can with you deepen that feeling of calm with a little bit of self-tapping. And then everybody can choose their own cue word to associate with this feeling of calm and where they feel it. Hold in mind the cue word, notice where they feel the calm in their bodies and another set of self-tapping. And I have them just watch me and that way I can cue them the speed and I like to do a nice, relaxing, slow speed when it comes to self-tapping. And not too long, only maybe eight to 10 reps, kind of back and forth. So grounding is also a very important term that we can teach our parents and we can even teach children who are in the room about grounding. 
And we can also encourage parents to do grounding exercises with their children as well as by themselves. So it, 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 as it says here, the premise is that to live in harmony and to be in the present, you must have good contact with the earth. So to be in harmony with the earth, we must be in contact with the earth. So we must be grounded to the earth and we must be in our bodies, feeling our bodies, aware of what is physically around us and what we are touching, what we are feeling in our bodies. This is grounding. So there's a lot of different ways that you can do grounding, but here is a very simple method. You can use the language that Maria has come up with right here. So you can ask everybody in the room over Zoom to stand up and, and stand in a very relaxed position to notice the feeling of the legs and the feet and then to really pay attention to the way in which the soles of the feet are adhered to the soles in the shoes and to the ground and just really feel the gravity of the earth pulling them down to the earth. You can ask them to feel the weight of their whole body resting on the legs and on the feet. And then you can ask them to even close their eyes and imagine that they have roots like a tree that go all the way into the earth, deep into the earth. And to notice the way in which their roots make them feel strong and really grounded into the earth. And then everyone together can breathe and you can do the breathing exercises with them while they're in this really grounded place. And here again, you can ask them to notice that weighty feeling in their body, to notice gravity holding them to the earth. And then you can Conduct a little self-tapping all together, nice and slow and calming to just deepen that positive feeling of groundedness and calm. So when we do the self-tapping this way in the slow way, the slow method, we are deepening a positive feeling. That's why we're not doing fast because if we are doing fast, we are desensitizing something difficult. We are desensitizing some, some strong emotion and we are probably also um, creating associations in the brain. And we don't want associations. We want a deepening of just the positive sensation. So that's why we go slow and we don't go longer than maybe eight or 10 movements back and forth. It's great to teach this because if children are using the, and with children, we'll also call it a butterfly tap or a butterfly hug. And we'll talk about, you know, bringing in those good feelings and, and holding them into your body and tapping them in. But if you're working with parents and kids are in the room, everybody can use, use it together and you can, the whole family can call it the butterfly hug. I really, really love that this slide and the next slide that, Mia, uh, that Maria has come up with. These are wonderful prompts to bring up positive resource states, positive affect states for the parents 
that you can then deepen with slow BLS. And a lot of these are uh, questions that I hadn't thought about asking until I read Maria's slides. So I think you will also find this a wonderful um, list of prompts. And um, of course, I think of resource development and installation or RDI as I think first developed by Andrew Leeds and Deborah Korn. I, I tend to simplify it a great deal. Um, the, the, the whole protocol for RDI, I tend to just simply find a way to bring up a positive affect state or positive sensations in the body in the way we did on the previous two slides, and then just deepen it with slow BLS and teaching my clients to use that as a tool at home that they can use any time they need to. Even in the middle of a, a crisis, they can practice with their Q word, the BLS, to step into a calmer state. So the first list of prompts are questions to bring up relational resources. So uh, the first question, who are the reference figures? Um, I think that Maria is saying who to bring up figures that have already been identified as positive resources or supports for the parents. Who is the person who understands you the most? Who is the person you talk to if you have a problem? Do you talk to any, anyone about what is happening to you? Who would that be? When would you talk to them? When do you talk to them? So after identifying who their supports are, who are the people who give them comfort, who are the person, who are the persons they confide in, you can ask them. There's a couple of different ways you can do this or different ways that I do it. One is I will ask the person to, and they can close their eyes if they want to, or they can focus on a spot. I'll ask them to just imagine even though they're in the coronavirus time and maybe they don't have any contact with this person personally, they can imagine being with that person in a place where they have been with that person, or they can imagine this person being with them right now sitting next to them. And they can think about what that person would say to them. They can think about that person's voice. They can think about that person, you know, maybe having their arm around them. And then they can notice what happens in their body as they think about that. And then you can deepen that feeling with some slow VLS. And just that person's name might be a good cue word that they can use. I've also had people imagine like a special, like internal meeting place where they imagine bringing in individuals who are um, supportive or comforting for them. And they can bring in even people that they had as children, um, maybe a, a, a friend's parent, or maybe a grandparent, even if that grandparent has passed. They can bring that person into their special meeting place where they, they can meet with them, they can listen to any words of wisdom, or they can Join with that person in any way that that works for them. They can imagine that person sharing their resources of strength or, 
or wisdom or or patience and calm and then they can bring that feeling into their body notice where they feel it and tap that in with some slow bls so just more ways to help parents self-regulate and allow them to have to be empowered to shift their affect state especially in those difficult moments when they are trying to be parents and trying to manage children who maybe have very very challenging behaviors um, these prompts are wonderful as well looking for personal resources that the parent carries and you you just want to deepen these resources for parents so what do you like the most about yourself and i would you know write all of these things down and and keep them so that we can refer to them again and again in our therapy sessions which are the things that you're best at i would also have the client write these things down keep it keep it in a journal and every one of these things can be turned into a resource memory, okay? That they can access, bring up, you can do a little guided imagery, and then you can tap that in with slow BLS. What are your hobbies, your interests, your passions? Let's think about the very best moments of your life. These are wonderful things to ask and just keep a log of every one of these answers because you could return to it and re uh, have the parent relive it and reinforce it and deepen it um, over and over. What has helped you in difficult times? What were the moments in which you felt you were successful? What were moments in which you felt you were able to face obstacles in the past? My 94 year old mother is quarantined by herself in her home and she's almost completely blind. And she is completely up, optimistic. She can't zoom because she can't see, but we talk on the phone, optimistic, happy mood is quite incredible and one of the things that she tells me is she thinks about the way she and her family got through the great depression as farmers in the 20s and 30s late 20s and 30s she thinks about the way she was able to get through world war ii she thinks about the way she was able to get through the different wars different times in which this country struggled and in which our family struggled and she said this gives her a sense that she can get through anything so there you go what were the moments when you learned to do new things what were the moments in which you liked yourself from a relational point of view So every one of those can be turned into a, a little guided imagery, a little, um, a little mental, a little mental movie that can be brought up and deepened with some slow BLS in order to access that positive affect state, depending on what the parent most needs. How do you feel about being now, now these are all resources around the relationship with the child. Resources to help the parent tap into good feelings about being a parent, good feelings about the relationship with the child when they need it most, which may be every single day during this um, COVID-19. How do you feel about being the mother of your child and can you describe yourself as a parent? This actually might or might not bring up something positive depending on the day 
or depending on the parent's history or how difficult their um, their lives have been have been as parents. What gives you the most joy in being the parent of your child? When do you feel secure as a parent of your child? Describe a time in the last week when you and your child really clicked. Or if they have to go back further than the last week, go back further than the last week. Parents often notice similarities between themselves and their children, and this is true. How do you think your child looks like you? You could ask, what, what things do your children or does your child have in common with you? You know, likes or dislikes or things that you enjoy doing together. What do you hope your child could have learned by having you as a parent? What would be even just one thing that you hope your child would have learned by having you as a parent? What would you need? What would you need? What quality would you need to face what's going on? And once the parent names that quality, you can then go look for a time when they have that quality in a, in a memory, in a past memory. Bring that up, bring that memory up, that mastery memory, and reinforce that mastery memory, deepen that mastery memory. Have them remember when they did have that quality. and then deepen that with some slow VLS. How confident are you that you will be able to soothe your child when he's upset? How do you do it? Tell me about a time when your child was upset and your child did come to you. And what can you take with you when all of this is over? Let me back up to the one that I just named. Tell me about a time when that child was upset and when your child did come to you. Can you tell me about that time? Now that would be a good, again, mastery memory. How did you soothe him? What did you do for him? How did that feel on the inside? How do you feel right now thinking about that time that you were able to soothe your child? Notice where you feel that good feeling in your body. And now deepen that with some slow VLS. And then what can you take with you when all of this is over? What do you hope to have gained from this experience of, the, of COVID-19 that you can take with you when all of this is over? It's a wonderful question as well. So the other thought that I have is that as you deepen positive affect states related to the questions on these last two slides, you can also take, ask the parent after you, after you complete that exercise, you can ask the parent to take that positive affect state and that inner resource that you've deepened or strengthened with them into a future challenging situation in their, in their mind's eye. So take with you now this strengthened, um, positive feeling in your body related to being a parent and imagine now how you would like to respond the next time your child has a tantrum and run that little mental movie as a future rehearsal. And then if that goes well, have the parent run that again as another little mental movie rehearsal and deepen it with some slow BLS. And you can do this with 
situation after situation after situation, any situation that is difficult and challenging for that parent can become a future rehearsal. They can take the, the resources that they've developed and deepened from these questions into these challenging situations and have little mental rehearsals of how they would like to respond and deepen them with a slow BLS. I think this is a, a wonderful way to give parents a tool that they can implement and use right away in the present day weeks when they, because they, they have to have something now, something that they can do right now that will help them survive all of this. Okay, I'm now going to invite Maria to join. Hi, Maria. So you're still on mute. Okay, now no. is that okay? Okay. Yes. May I share my screen? I'm going to stop sharing and now you can share and I will take myself off. Okay. Okay. We have seen uh, until now all the resources and questions we can ask parents and what we can do to strengthen the resources and skill of parents in this difficult moment. Now let's see how we can build our work plan. Uh, we know that we are facing a very difficult moment and it is very important to understand that we must have a good work plan in order to organize a deep and prompt intervention for parents in difficulty. We will see how therapeutic work on Big T related to a delicate moment like the one we are experiencing sometimes requires a more global intervention, which involves also the evaluation of patient's life history. In particular, it is important to identify all the aspects of the traumatic life history of the patient that can be reactivated by the coronavirus event um, and can contribute to the patient's re-traumatization. It becomes important, therefore, to see how, in some situations, a big trauma reactivates unresolved aspects related to subject history. Hence, when we work with the parent, it will be important to identify and work on big trauma of this moment, if any, and all, all the targets connected to this traumatic situation. But it will be, be equally important to build a good conceptualization that is to understand if there are and what are all the parents' life events that somehow interfere and are linked to the traumatic experience of the moment. When we realize that the reprocessing of the current traumatic event, it is not enough or in situation in which we have the opportunity to do a more complete therapeutic process with our patient, it will be important to proceed with a good conceptualization in order to plan a more complete and global intervention with the patient. To proceed with a good conceptualization, it will be important to start from the life history of our patient to collect the attachment history, also based on the question of the adult attachment interview, and then the traumatic history of the patient. So let's see what are um, the most important questions taken from the adult att attachment interview to collect uh, the, adult, the attachment history of the parent is very, very important. 
uh, one of the most important questions of the adult attachment interview is uh, the one about the adjective. You ask your parents to choose five adjectives or words that reflect your relationship with your mother, and then you ask the same thing to the father, starting from as far back as you can remember in early childhood. Then you write all the adjectives and names, and then for every adjective, you ask, can you think of a memory or an incident that would illustrate why you choose to describe your relationship? And then you put the adjective chosen by patient. It's very important to have episodes or events that can illustrate the adjective or the words that the subject choose to describe the relationship. Then, sorry, then you ask, uh, can you think of, uh, I wonder if you could tell me to which parents did you feel the closest and why? And why isn't there this feeling with the other parent? And you know what, uh, all the, que uh, this question, for example, uh, require um, also the reflecting functioning of the subject. And uh, you can uh, see and you can evaluate uh, if the subject, if the parent is, ab is able to reflect upon the mind of himself and on the, chi on the child mind. Because we know that reflective functioning is an important factor, very linked to a security of attachment in the child. Then you can ask, for example, when you were upset or worried, and or in emotional difficulty as a child, what would you do? And how did your parent react? Can you tell me about some specific incident? Then you ask, uh, when you got hurt physically, what would happen? Can you think of a specific or particular incident? Then you have a question about separation. Uh, do you remember the first time you were separated from your parents? How did you react and how did they react? Can you think of other significant separation? Then you ask about rejection. Did you ever feel rejected as a child? How old were you when you had that feeling? And what did you do then? Why do you think your parents behave like they did? As you can see, other important reflecting functioning questions. And then you can ask, do you think that they realize how you felt? Were your parents ever threatening you? in a way, maybe for discipline or, or even jokingly. How old were you at that time? Did it happen frequently? Do you feel this experience affect you now as an adult? And then we ask in general, how do you think your overall experience with your parents have affected your adult personality? Are there any aspects to your early experiences that you feel were a setback in your development? Then you ask, why do you think your parents behave as they did during your child? And you can also ask, were there any other adults with whom you were close like parents as a child? Other than any difficult experiences you have already described, have you had any other experiences which you should regard as potentially traumatic? And then you can end the interview asking another important question uh, about uh, also the parenting. We have been focusing a lot on the past in this interview, but I'd like to end up looking quite a ways into the future. Um, and so um, you ask, we were just talking about what you think you may have learned from your childhood experience. Now I'd like to end by asking you, what would you hope your child or your imagined child 
might have learned from his experience of being parented by you. Mm? So those are some of the, of the adult attachment interview questions that are very important to collect the history of a parent. And also that are very important to see the link between the history of a parent and the relationship with the child. For every question, it's very important to collect episodes about a rejective and situation. Important because for the adult attachment interview, the classification is based on the coherence of the mind. And so it's important to see the coherence or the discrepancy between episodic and semantic memories, for example. So you can use those questions when you work with the parent, when you need to construct a therapeutic plan to have the attachment history of the patient, of your parent. So it's very, very important. Let's see um, how to construct the conceptualization and the identification of the target. Mm -hmm. um, it's very, very important to collect the, the history of the patient, as we have seen. During the history taking, uh, if the patient struggles to find memories of the past, you can ask the patient to retrieve diaries, photographs, parents' written letters, childhood team that record in family dynamic that can help us to collect the subject's life history to identify all the critical points. Then we can also use the floodback technique starting from the current traumatic event, for example, the coronavirus pandemic and major difficulty that the parent experienced related to this moment. So we identified the negative condition, the emotion and the physical sensation associated with that moment. And then we go back to the history of the subject to identify all the events related to the trigger. We can also start from the symptoms manifested by the parents with the flowback technique. We can identify the aspect of his life history that are more closely linked to the difficulty of this moment. After we identify the vulnerability area, then we proceed with the work on those targets. So, Let's see the plan. The work plan will be structured in this way. At first, we will start with the processing of big trauma linked to coronavirus pandemic, if any, and the difficulties associated with this moment. For example, the sense of inadequacy in managing the relationship with the child or child anxiety. Then we work on the relational trauma the aspects in parents' life events that are linked to this current trauma and difficulties. For example, a parent may experience difficulty in managing the child anxiety because this situation could make him feel inadequate and this inadequacy could be related to his attachment history. So this inadequacy could be reactivated when he is trying to manage the anxiety and in a critical moment with the child. Then we will work on the future scenario, like the next time the parent will have to deal with this difficulty. Mm -hmm. So now let's see the recent traumatic episode protocol that is very useful for the work on the present trauma in this moment, on the current traumatic event. We know that the MDR treatment can be part of the intervention in the peritraumatic phase. It can be used in the reprocessing of targets in the aftermath of a critical event. The recent traumatic episode protocol allows therapists to, click, to quickly intervene on the disturbing points triggered by the traumatic experience since the first moment. So we can use this protocol to work with parents on the traumatic event that is happening or has just happened is a short, specialistic approach aimed at treating the crisis and the post-trauma suffering, and it allows therapists to desensitize all the disturbing signs already manifested in the first weeks. This protocol optimizes intervention times, and it is useful to avoid the cumulative effect that instead may arise when we experience a traumatic event and there is an imprompt intervention. Mm -hmm. 
In this protocol, the traumatic episode is considered as a continuum hmm, uh, of the trauma, which is the original event or significant consequences. All the experiences and concern related to the critical event up to the present moment. So we start from the trauma or the most disturbing original element and then proceed to all the consequences. So in this type of protocol, the patient is asked to narrate, to narrate the entire traumatic event while the therapist does bilateral stimulation, for example, while the therapist does tapping throughout the entire narrative of the event. Then the subject is asked to identify the most disturbing points of the narrative and each point of disturbance will be considered a target that must be reprocessed. We will work with EMD, EMDR, Contact and standard EMDR protocol. We know that in the recent traumatic episode protocol during the reprocessing phase, we will return back to the target several times after each set of bilateral stimulation. Asking for the SAT because this is a short protocol that is specifically focused on the recent traumatic event. When the SAD is zero or ecological, then we will install the positive cognition. We will do body scanning closure and then the re-evaluation. However, we know that we can plan a more complete and deep work with our patient and try to work not only on the specific and current traumatic event with the recent traumatic episode protocol, but also, if necessary, we can build a conceptualization and work on the subject's life history aspects that are linked to current traumatic event. So, let's see. Uh, another important point uh, that is the work with the part of the self. Until now, we have seen how to build a good conceptualization and we have also seen how we can use the recent traumatic episode protocol. Sometimes, however, we need to work with the patient's part of the self. Working with the part of the self can support us in collecting history phase in the building of a good conceptualization and in case of blocks and defenses. Therefore, this work can actually support us during all the therapeutic work with our patient from the first session until the end of the therapy. In particular, working with the part of self is very useful in all cases where we can find blocks in order to trace the patient's measure difficulty in a more specific manner. So, why do we talk about dissociative aspects? Because we can meet parents who manifest dissociative aspects and we must take this condition into account in order to conduct an effective work with them. Because we can use the MDR even in case of block or defenses. So even with dissociation, it's just that we need to be able to work also with the part of the self. We know that the personality is made up of different parts or ego state. That in an individual with a positive history, or we could say without unresolved traumas, have fluid boundaries among them and are well integrated with each other. This means that the person can move from one room to another without thinking, this is not me. When the person grows up, in a sufficiently good relational environment, these parts develop and act in a co-conscious way. Some conflicts could be present, but such conflicts are aware and accessible to the individual. We will be able to ask questions and try to find a solution. Unfortunately, when an individual experiences one or more traumatic events, that are not processed. 
in particular related to attachment because we know that everything starts from attachment dynamics. So in that case, rigid boundaries are created between the various, the various parts of the self that do not allow consciousness and awareness of each other. This situation could lead to a dissociative personality structure. So traumatic events create an internal break that generates child part and protective part, the defense, that are blocked at the trauma time and are still dissociated. So when the subject experienced a traumatic event, we have the child or vulnerable parts that hold back the patient's pain and that are blocked at the trauma time. And then we have the defense, which are the protective parts that intervene to defend, protect and deal with the traumatic event. So it is important to understand this concept and ex explain it to our patient with the psychoeducation. So we are going to see how it will be very important in cases of blocks and difficulties to work with the protective parts that often do not allow us to assess the traumatic event because they are not yet integrated. They do not trust us and they fear that they will not be able to protect the subject. So we can have the vulnerable parts, the child, you can call child part, traumatized part, injured part, that hold back the patient's pain and wounds of the traumatic event and that are blocked at the trauma time. Towards the child parts, the patient can experience a rejection a feeling of annoyance, a phobia towards the pain of that part. Um, we must understand that this feeling of annoyance and rejection actually represent a defense against the pain, the pain experienced. So this part need, first of all, to be seen, understood, welcome in their pain. For this reason, the first goal with this part will be to elicit empathy, care, and understanding from the adult part. It is important to explain to our patients that they don't have to do difficult things because the main needs of a child part actually is to be recognized and to be seen. Recognition and mirroring, in fact, are the key aspects that allow the possibility to deal with any traumatic event. We must remember that often child parts of our patient have never been seen. And therefore the adult part must do this kind of intervention towards child part. It's a very important intervention. The child part must also know that she no longer lives the trauma time that the adult part is strong and autonomous and can manage what has happened. Let's see about the defense part. Obviously, we know that very often the access to the child part can be blocked by defenses that are necessary for our patient because they saved his life they allowed him to move forward and to survive. So we well understand how much is important to take into account and integrate defenses in order to create an atmosphere of cooperation with all of them. In fact, we know that at the trauma time, that parts develop with the aim to defend the child parts to protect the child parts. To do this, they had to mature adaptive and necessary strategies and behavior for the, for the patient's survival. And they can change, of course, rules and tasks throughout life. They can change rules, but they will always be present. This is one of the principles that 
we always have to keep in mind when we work with our patient. It is important that we explain to our patient that this part will always be parts of him because the patient will always need them. But when the parts feel recognized, understood and legitimized, they will be space and time oriented and so could change in a more adaptive way the manner in which they protect the patient in the present time. So the secret is that it is necessary to distinguish between the goal of the defenses and their method. It is clear that the defense that is still anchored to the past is still using methods that are tied to the past. In fact, time and space orientation is one of the first interventions that it is important to do with defense in order to make them understand that they can change their manners, but they will always be strong and protective for our patient and they will always be necessary. So the first step in the work with our patient is that we have to make them understand that defenses need to trust. In fact, the first goal with protective parts is the construction of an alliance with them. When they feel recognized, understood, and legitimized, they will allow us to access to important information about patients' life and fragilities. Maybe they will allow us also to work on this big present trauma, for example. It is important because sometimes the part protects also this big present trauma because maybe this big trauma is triggering other past trauma and so the part activate in the same way and maybe in the, be in the beginning doesn't allow the patient to process this moment, this big trauma. Hmm? So it is important to consider the behavior of this part in the light of their protective function. And then it will be possible to find alternative protective manners to reach the same objective. The goal, therefore, is the integration of the defenses in order to get closer to the child part and allow the patient to start taking care of his pain. So, in this slide, we can see, just to give you some example of different protective parts that you can have, just some example. We can see the parts uh, uh, that blocks, the part that controls, the part that anesthetizes, the emotion, the, the very negative emotion. Defensive strategies can be different, and the patient throughout his life had to use multiple, multiple defensive strategies to cope with what happened to him. This is because he was alone to manage these difficulties in order to move forward and survive. So let's see. Uh, in summary, when we can use parts work, when is important to use part work? And you can see that you can use the past work for the integration of the self to ask for collaboration in different phases of the therapy. But the work with the part is very important also for psychoeducation, for motivation, and to understand secondary advantages of the symptoms. You can use also what part to ask for help to collect the patient's history and to work on blocks and defenses at any phase of the process and also obviously for emergency management and crisis movement. In fact, we will see that part one will be important also in the work with parents to better understand how the current difficulties experienced are directly linked to critical aspects of their life history. Mm -hmm. So, Let's see what we do with all the parts. To reach integration uh, with all the parts, we need to approach them. We welcome the parts. 
we welcome all the part because they are all important, all necessary, and they must all be integrated. We invite the patient to visualize them. We must promote empathy toward them. We need to reassure the part that they are very important, that they are part of the patient, that they, they will be stay always with the patient. They will be there, they will protect the patient. They are very important part of the patient. They, we need to understand the part, we need to recognize the part, legitimize and validate the part. And also we need to promote enhancement. The most important difficulty, the most important difference between the child parts and defenses is that with vulnerable parts, we mainly activate the caregiving system. So with the child parts, we need to activate the caregiving, the caregiving system. While with protective parts, we have to create alliance and cooperation. The defense know how to best protect the patient because they have always had this role and they also know how to best manage the patient's wounds. So we need to go with the defense, with the protective part to work on traumas because these protective parts know exactly how to manage also the different wounds, the past and the present wounds. So it's very important. Let's see how some aspect is, I just can, I just want to give you some idea uh, to see how we can recognize when there is no integration. For example, we could observe a, a part that is not yet integrated is not space time oriented. The part doesn't know yet that we are here now, that the past is past. The past is not actually here with us now in 2020. Maybe the part lives, still lives in trauma time, so it's very important to see. And it's a very important intervention to orient and to space time orient the part. Sometimes we can see that there is no understanding of the rule. Especially there is no understanding from the adult part of the patient about the protective goal of the defense. In fact, sometimes the patients tend to focus on the manner of the defense and not on the protective rule. But as we have said, we must distinguish between them between the protective rule and the manner. The manner is an action manner because the, the part doesn't know that we are here today. The goal is always the protection. The goal of the part is always the protection, but the method is ancient because the part still have a foot in the past and therefore it is as if they are still on war. If there is no integration between parts, there is no empathy with them. Some aspects of non-integration show that, for example, there is isn't knowledge between parts or one of the parts doesn't know the full history of the subject. Sometimes we see that there is no integration with the subject struggle to visualize the part or keep in contact with the part. Sometimes we see the part is afraid of being sent away. Therefore, one of the first important interventions with our patient is to reassure the part. Patients does recognize sometimes as part as its own. Mm? It's an important sign that there is still no integration. So we need to work for make the patient recognize that the part is own. Mm. Those are just some examples uh, that tells you about uh, what it means uh, when there is no integration. Mm. Those examples are also useful because you need to use also uh, this example like exercise to work with, with patient to promote integration. Mm. Uh, for example, another important thing that you can do 
is to construct a dissociative table. You can call dissociative table um, or meeting place. The goal of the dissociative table is to promote co-awareness, time, space, orientation, and empathy with all the parts, with all and among the parts. It's very important to use the dissociative table and we will see how we can build it also for parents. Also for parents, when you want to work on the relationship between parents and child, or, and also when you want to work on the difficulties that parents have in relationship with the child. Mm -hmm. So it's very important Mm, we use it at all stage of the process. We can use it uh, in all stage of, of our therapeutic process when the patient, for example, is blocked or in case where there, mm, there may, may be an emergency. Or, as we will see, also to identify in a more direct and specific way the link between the current problem of the patient and his life history. Let's see how we can build the dissociative table or meeting place. Mm -hmm. So we can ask, for example, the patient to imagine a safe meeting place to encourage communication between parts of the cell, especially those who are reclutant we must be careful because it is important to integrate in particular the rejecting part, the avoidant part, and the parts that doesn't trust yet. Identify and visualize all the parts available that represent the different aspects of the, of the self. So we do psychoeducation regarding the presence of the parts, that we all have vulnerable parts and defenses. And it is important that we make the knowledge of all the parts that represent the various aspects of the self. Then we ask the patient to call the different parts of the self for the reunion. We try to make the acquaintance of each part. Ask to each part to provide a detailed description regarding age, sex, history, physical description, and function of each of them. We have to keep in mind that each part has its own function that must be understood. We must identify and recognize the defenses, the rule, and the importance of each one. Obviously, we have to respect their times and manners, also respect their function, their fears, then we must focus on the obstacle with respect to the re resolution of the symptoms and evaluate the obstacle for the continuation of the therapy. We ask for collaboration of all parts and in particular of those who are blocking the process because we know that they have specific reasons that must be understood and legitimized. We know that protective part have the key to unlock the therapeutic process with our patient. We have to understand and validate the reason why the defense had to behave in a certain way and help her to be space-time oriented. It is important to explain to them that the situation now is different and then no one will ask them to do anything that they don't want to do. But rather than each defense will find a more adaptive manner to help the patient today. We have to ask her for help to find other manners to handle the present situation. Hmm? So let's see how you can use also the dissociative table or meeting place also to work with parents. We have created a meeting place to work with parents' defenses regarding the difficulties they experience in the relationship with their children. In this case, we ask to all the parts of the parent to come for a meeting, but this time 
the pairs they have to discuss about the current difficult situation in their relationship with the child with with, with the child hmm? oh i have problem with my son okay so let's ask to all of your part to come and to discuss about your difficulty with your son with your daughter hmm? we ask to our patient to find a safe place when where parts can meet we ask them to focus on the difficult moment we ask them for collaboration and we try to make the quietness of each part this is very useful in order to identify the parents aspect that are more implicated in the difficulties that they are experiencing so we must know all the parts that intervene then we we must be sure that there is co-awareness among parts and that all parts know that there is an adult part that is the parent of a child who is called in a certain way and with certain years old we must focus on the adult part of the parent and reinforce the resources of this part and then we have to ask which are the parts that need to say something about the difficulties in the relationship with the child it is important to ask if there is a part that doesn't agree to collaborate this part must be understood accepted and integrated and we must create a collaboration with them because defend sometimes some because this part is defending something that is very important for our patient so let's see some question that we can ask to the part when we do meeting place for the parents with the parents to discuss about problem with their in the relationship with with this child so some question we can ask would be is there any part of you who want to say something when you see your child suffering what does that part would like to say how does your life history is linked to your child life history and to the relationship with your child is there any part of you that fears something if this difficult situation in the relationship with your children disappears could this difficulty or these symptoms that you or your child experience be helpful to you in some way is there any part of you that fears something if the difficulty manifested by your children disappear for example the fear could be that if the difficulty or symptoms disappear something could, could happen this is also to understand as the secondary benefits of the symptoms then we can ask is there any part of you that feel that she can communicate only throughout your child difficulty is there any part of you that feel that she can communicate only throughout the difficult situation in the relationship with your children is there a part of you that maybe also needs to maintain these symptoms or maybe there is a part that has some difficulties and is struggling to let go of the child's symptoms because these symptoms express something that can be useful for family dynamic for example for instance we can think of a conflict situation between parents that are forced to stay together at home in this moment with, with, with their children for many hours where the child's symptoms of hyperactivity for example or anxiety or the need of the child to sleep in bed with parents sometimes can be useful for parents to maintain and manage relational distance or not to enter into conflict too much so the symptoms of the child that could be a hyper anxiety or the need to be with parents all the time or to draw their attention can be a way to regulate the relationship in parents couple to maintain a certain relationship structure in the family system so be careful about that is there any part of you that find it hard to let the child's difficulty go does that part feel anything and why if you validate the part 
if you listen the part you can catch the meaning of the child's symptoms sometimes mm? and you can ask for help to the part to work on the difficulties that the parent is facing you can ask is there any part of you that find it hard to let difficult situation in the relationship with your children go does that part fear anything and why sometimes we have seen that parents see the manifestation of anxiety and stress of the child as a way to legitimize their suffering their suffering or stress it is a way to take care of this suffering in an indirect way sometimes we have seen that in the parents therefore for each parent we can ask is this part protective you and your child somehow does this part allow you and your child to do something? Does she prevent you and your child from acting something? Then we can proceed with the integration of the part to make her feel understood, to ask her for collaboration and try to ask her to let the child's symptom go. We then ask, is this part visible? How old is she? What happened to her? We can take care of the part of the parents who sometimes intervenes and tends to contribute to the expression of the child's symptoms. We have seen that this work with parents' part, when we work with parents, is very effective, very useful, has an important impact. Also for the work on the intergenerational transmission uh, of the trauma. Mm. Um, so far we have seen some possible intervention that can be implemented with parents. We have seen how you can work with parents on the trauma of this movement and how this kind of work can be an excellent help to work on the traumatization of the child related to this movement. Mm, we have seen other ways that can help us when the specific work on traumatization is the block or not enough. We have seen how to do, if it's possible, a more complete work plan that includes uh, parents' life history that can in interfere with the difficulty and trauma of the moment. We have also tried to provide you with tools to intervene in case of luck, but also allow us to identify links between the symptoms and difficulties that the parenting experience right now towards the child and their own history. Uh, we can do a lot to help our parents in this difficult uh, moment and helping the parent, we know it means also to help a lot also children. Um, so, we hope that today this moment together will help you a little bit in your work with parents and to feel that we are together in faces in facing this difficult moment. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, I can ask for um, my colleague. Thank you so much, Maria. You know, as you were talking, I was just thinking about how parents who have a poor relationship with the child parts within themselves, who don't even know that they have child parts that are activated and oftentimes they feel yeah. um, shame, shameful feelings toward the child parts of themselves and they cannot take care of the child parts of themselves then how can they possibly know how to take care of their children during the COVID-19, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and, yeah. so, and, and so they do not have that integration. They have the disorganized, unresolved attachment that um, is, is activated from the relationship with the child, from the child seeking their attention um and seeking their comfort it is it is such a perfect storm um and such a difficult situation for those parents so it's such a good reminder for us to be aware and and to really look for those parts of self that are not integrated not cared yeah. for 
um, it's a really important piece of work. And I, I thank you for presenting this today. That was um, a very, very good, thorough uh, presentation. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So um, we're done a little bit early, but that's, that's okay. And I think uh, we can sign off. And I want to say thank you also to all of the people who have joined us and to uh, those who will be watching the recording as well. We have people from all parts of the world. So some, for some people, it is midnight and one o'clock right now. So <laughs> <laughs> one in the morning. So it is, um, they are quite dedicated to be on uh, from their parts of the world. So thank you to everyone who's attended. Yeah. Okay. So thank, thank you, you everybody. everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank Take you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.